Well, when you hear somebody read your career bio like that, I <laughs> law school sent it over, and, <laughs> and I'm either getting really old, which I am, or I can't keep a job from the sounds of it. <laughs> Uh, but it is a uh, pleasure to be here. I think we are uh, here at a very important time in Michigan's history and in American history. Um, my presentation here this morning is going to uh, address uh, American judges and specifically Michigan judges uh, citing or authoritatively relying on transnational law or some other uh, law to which you had no role in the making of. You didn't elect the person that wrote the law. You were not part of any uh, sovereign system that uh, placed a judge in place that may have put down the legal principle. But nonetheless, a an American judge would be relying on that authority to make uh, American law uh, bypassing your state legislature here uh, in Michigan or your United States Congress uh, if we're talking Washington DC uh, you know as a as a professor or a teacher now we think in theories and, and I and I kind of said well how is this happening and how what 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 is a what is causing judges at the federal level at the state level to feel like they can rely on authorities to which no American ever had any participation in uh, the making of the law. And what I've come up with, I think, is that people tend to use the courts to advance a political agenda when they don't have enough votes to get their position through the politically accountable branch of government, the legislature. Now, I look around the room and I see a lot of conservatives here, and, and I think we should be careful to understand this is a bigger issue. This is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. This is not a conservative or a liberal issue because it, it, historically in the past, you know, we conservatives have from time to time used that same technique, not using international law, but used the technique of the courts uh, to advance an agenda. But, but what I want to focus on today is how dangerous that is to constitutional democracy. What do you call a person who has the power to make law that will subject the citizens by force of law and punishment, and then the person that makes that law isn't accountable to the people? Either that or a judge these days, I guess. <laughs> And I don't want to spend time, uh, too much time at the, uh, on the federal problem, because this is a federal problem too, but we're here today addressing uh, the state problem. But, but don't misunderstand. There is a very large portion of the federal bench uh, also that believes they have the right, that they have been given some anointed power to make law up, not based on anything that an elected representative or a member of Congress passed or an American president passed, but perhaps uh, something that a German or a French uh, legislator passed. Now, relying on foreign precedents conflicts with the very structure and history of the American Constitution. You all are very familiar with the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. If if this podium up here is the American Constitution, it is the American Constitution, and this microphone that is coming out of this podium is law. Nothing works unless the electricity here, unless we can plug into a power source. Do you notice that this microphone is plugged into a power source? A member of Congress cannot act unless they can go to the American Constitution and find a, a power source and plug into that and then they can pass a law. <laughs> there are very few power sources in the American Constitution allowing the American Congress to exercise their power. Where's all the rest of the power left to? States and to the to people. And so if you allow a state judge or a federal judge to rely on a law passed in France or Germany or Pakistan or Syria 
or, uh, South, or some country in South America. They are relying, uh, where, where, where are they getting the authority to have that law become a force of law? It's not. Now, you're going to find something very, very interesting when these judges do that. It, it, it's, it, well, first of all, it's called surrendering sovereignty. <laughs> because when you are citing and you are allowing a judge to believe that their role allows them to make up law, without being elected by anybody to write the law as part of a political process that also involves the signing of a law by a governor or a president. You are surrendering sovereignty because now you are taking the law of another nation and allowing a judge in this country to deem it a force of law that you must comply with. Here's the problem with it. International, transnational, and foreign decisions, they come and they emerge from a very complex social, historical, political, religious, institutional background of which these judges that are citing the law have no idea. They are completely ignorant. You ask some judge, you ask any judge that has cited transnational parent, uh, precedent and use that law as a on an authoritative basis for their judgment in their decision, you ask them, well, what do you know about the judge that wrote that opinion? Were they appointed by the people? Is it a dictator? You know, how, how is the process? What is the authority of the judge there? Is it a country or a precedent that is based in a political religious foundation? Is it, a, uh, is it a judge that has any political accountability even within the country where the judge is sitting? I mean, here at least in our nation, at the state level, we elect a lot of our judges. At the federal level, there is some political accountability because, you know, even though a judge is appointed for life as long as they behave, an American president in the United States Senate ratifies that appointment. And so there's at least some political accountability when you are relying on an American court decision. But these American judges that go beyond what their proper role within a functional democratic republic should be, they've got no idea. They've got no idea from which the legal system or the political religious system from which their law they're citing has emerged from. They just know that it is a way for them to get to the result they want to get to, and it's a way for them to take a little fig leaf and say, I'm not just making this up off the top of my head, I'm relying on something that is legal. That is the surrendering of sovereignty, and it is a very, very large step toward dictatorship. Decisions rendered by judges sitting in international courts or courts of other countries outside the U.S. Uh, are outside the U.S. democratic tradition. Uh, judges of foreign countries are rarely, if ever, if ever, the product of an equally democratic tradition to the one of which we are familiar with. But yet our American judges feel free to cite them. Should the Michigan Supreme Court really be influenced by the Supreme Court of Zimbabwe? Think about it. Here's the other concern that you need to be aware of. Called cherry picking. I don't know. I, 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 was, I was not a very good basketball player. I sat on the bench most of my high school career. It was a, a term that we learned, it was called cherry picking. You know, sometimes if you sat down underneath your basket and everybody went the other way and then you got the ball back and you're sitting right up and the, they would throw you the ball all the way down and there would be no one to defend it and you'd have an easy, easy hop. Well, that is what these judges are doing. They're cherry picking. You notice that there's a whole lot of transnational, international law of which they can choose from out there. And if they got a political agenda, or if a person has a political agenda that they don't have the votes for in the state legislature, but they can find a judge who they agree with, 
Well, guess what? It's not going to take them very long to find some international precedent somewhere that agrees with that agenda. But it's a matter of cherry picking because you can find something just on the opposite side too. <coughs> Let me give you an example. Most nations in the world have nothing near the due process we give American citizens when government decides to take away somebody's life, liberty, or their property. You don't see courts picking those decisions these days, do you? Most courts around the world, so, so the right to jury, the right to confront witnesses, cross-examine, the right to appeal, access to justice, much greater in the United States than anywhere else. So why aren't we relying on that transnational law? Most uh, cases in most European countries um, around the world direct funding to religious organizations and pay for funding of the teaching of religion in schools. We haven't seen them citing those cases. <coughs> yeah. Uh, generally, most laws, if you look at European, look around the world in Africa, South America, most countries have laws that are much tougher against abortion and make it much more difficult to get an abortion. I've not seen a single American judge cite one of those cases. But yet they cherry pick and they find international law that, that, and they will say, well, you know, this is where we want to go, so I will find some country somewhere uh, that has had a judge uh, or, or a legislature pass a law that says what I want it to say, and then without even knowing anything about their system, I'm going to use that as authority to make a law in the United States that will have the force of law and punishment against any American citizen or any Michigan citizen that dares disagree with the ink that I have put on this judicial enactment. Folks, we're in a battle for the very conscience of this nation, for the very understanding of what constitutional good governance means. The fact that you got up this morning with many, many other things you could do, and you came here, I got to believe you understand that at some level, and that you're ready to take some action. This is a very small step, but it's a very, very important step. I challenge you to take that action. Because countries that take a more traditional view of social issues are virtually never cited by any judge these days. <coughs> but yet we see decisions all over the place uh, supporting controversial domestic social issues uh, all the time. Same-sex marriage, abortion, all. All of those came to be through a judge in large part relying on some transnational law, some transnational understanding of law. Now, we've got the Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution that says something interesting. It says that uh, a law of Congress or a treaty, for example, becomes the supreme law of the land. Well, I would start paying attention to those treaties that are, that are being enacted uh, by, by the President and then, and, and then seeking ratification in the Senate. Why? Because if, if, if you can get along in that way, well, then what's going to happen? Now you can supersede any state policy that you've, that you've enacted through your elected people. Now, here's, the, here's where that matters uh, in the context of why you're here today. Even when we have been able to stop treaties that are, that are a violate that would interfere with your right as a, as a Michigan resident to make your own law, even when we've stopped the ratification of those treaties in the United States Senate, Guess what happens? They go find a friendly judge. And, and then they tell the judge, look around the world. The whole world has signed on to that treaty practically except for the United States. And so they call it something like customary law. And so then they argue to the judge, even though the United States hasn't ratified it, even though through the politically accountable process that's provided for in the American Constitution, 
has not occurred yet. You have the power, Your Honor, through the ink in your pen, to unilaterally make it the rule of law for this nation. If you don't think we're in a battle for the very conscience of this nation, for the very understanding of what constitutional democracy in, our, in the republic that we live in, we are. And every day we need to be more vigilant. We need to look at these things. We need to specifically um, look and see how uh, the use of transnational law uh, in the courts um, allows for cherry picking, allows uh, results in the surrendering of sovereignty, uh, and in a very dangerous way, uh, allows the courts uh, to usurp the proper role of your politically accountable representatives, many of which who are here today. Um, a couple of final points. In Michigan, we elect our judges, our Supreme Court. So there's some political accountability here, at least. <clears throat> Um, we make our laws under the Michigan Constitution through the state legislature looking to the Michigan Constitution and then checking to see is there a power source authorizing them to make a law. And that's how we have law that is politically accountable to the people. If we don't like what the legislator did and the governor signed, well, we've got an election coming up. If we're relying on a decision from a German judge about what our Constitution means. There is no governor accountable. There's no state legislator accountable with which you can uh, have any say. Uh, political accountability has to matter. That's what a constitutional republic is grounded on. That's what democracy uh, is grounded in. I'm going to leave it there. I gotta say though that there is a number of judges uh, and law professors as well uh, and mostly law professors these days but four decisions emerge from a, that, that complex social historical uh, religious political institutional background with, with that most judges and I'm going to suggest that most uh, professors don't understand uh, because if they did they wouldn't be making arguments uh, uh, like this law violates the free exercise clause. If you go and study, and, and, I, and I haven't spoken much about Sharia because there's a lot of folks that are going to speak on it, and you had the, the clip there. But just one point as a, tra as a matter of transition. It's not a free exercise clause issue. That's how they're framing it in front of the judges. They're saying, you know, if, if you don't allow halal meat, for example, in the prisons, you're violating the free exercise clause. If you don't um, allow for Sharia courts in a divorce situation or a domestic situation involving what's going to happen to a woman who's married to uh, a, a man and, and you don't allow us to do it under our way, that's not a free exercise clause issue if you understand the social, political, religious foundation for those laws. They don't have, we have an establishment clause here. It's an establishment clause issue. And if you want to see what it looks like in its fully mature form, instead of just somebody asking a judge to rely on one of these foreign precedents, if you want to see what it looks like in its fully mature form, it's the removal of the establishment clause in the American Constitution and the Michigan Constitution and replacing it with a clause that you can go look up in the countries where it's become fully mature. And in those countries it says, the established religion of the state shall be Islam, and all legislation must be consistent with the Sharia. So it's not a free exercise clause issue, it's, a, it's an establishment clause issue. And if you tell, and if you've got an opportunity to explain that to an American judge someday, I think that's the biggest confusion that American judges have, because <laughs> nobody's explained it to them. They just, been told that if they fail to do this, they're violating the free exercise. Something to think about. Um, thanks for having me, and, and um, be vigilant, and 
don't just leave here today feeling like, wow, we had some speakers say some interesting things. I challenge you to leave here today and become citizen states. Your children depend on it. 